reckless movement uh, for some reason is not covered in the main rule book they just kind of skip over it it is covered um, for the most part everything you need to know is right here on uh, the player aid placard here which uh, if you ask me you should have out but some people may have not pulled this out of the box they think they've got it all or they're not paying attention to it but just so you are aware since it's not in the rule book reckless movement allows you to move two extra spaces um, in doing so you spend two energy each hero spends two energy to move those two extra spaces and also mar marching recklessly does not allow you to just move one space for one energy you pretty much spending two energy to move up to two more spaces um, you uh, are going to have to roll your navigate skill die because you could still get lost moving recklessly but you don't have time to look for both food and gold so you're gonna have to pick one do you look for food or do you look for gold most people are gonna look for food um, but for whatever reason um, you you choose the last thing is, is that you get a negative two um, uh, bonus to your um, moon die roll during the villain phase. So during uh, Mirza Noctis's phase, phase five, you get a minus two because essentially, like they said many times in the narrative, you are keeping ahead of him. You are, uh, he's not able to, his ever watching eye is not able to keep up with you if you're moving faster. You'll see the slower you move, uh, the you get a negative uh, adjustment to that die. It's gonna go up more likely. Whereas if you move recklessly, you get to move two extra spaces, minus two to the moon die roll you just lose two energy and you probably aren't going to find any gold but anyways that's what moving recklessly um, does for you all right so let's talk about gear upgrades uh, these are um, increasing your stats so your attack stat your exploration any of your skills or even your vitals you increase those by paying the amount that you have yet to fill in um, going clockwise around the circle and then you get to increase that number by one these are purchasable anytime you are in a monastery but you have to have in this volume this is different for various volumes of explore it in this volume you have to have unlocked a crypt and then you visit a monastery all right so Unlock a crypt. You can see here this is having unlocked one. That's why this line is here. Then at that point, you can purchase up to your second gear upgrade of any given stat. All right. So you can purchase up to, say, two here on my vital. Up until that point that you have unlocked a crypt and then visit a monastery, you can only increase your stats via power up cards. Um, so just keep that in mind that. The only way to increase your stats until you have unlocked your first crypt and visited a monastery is power-up cards. All right, power-up cards are um, probably the most important deck in the game because they are going to help you increase your stats, your abilities, your skills um, much faster than purchasing gear upgrades in monasteries and, and things like that. So what power-up cards are going to do uh, they're going to give you sometimes options like this or you choose one so here you can either get a uh, health vital upgrade of three or a second mastery upgrade of one also whenever you draw this card you're going to get a negative one roll stat to your moon die roll during the villain phase let's look at another one here this one just very simply gives you plus one to navigate minus one to that moon die phase. Not all of them have the minus one, that just happens to be how this deck is working out. So this one's only for your second mastery, minus one. Let's find uh, let's find some better ones here. Here's one where you get uh, second mastery and navigate. So you can see it says ants, so you get plus one to both of them. Back here, this one was a choose one, so you had to pick one. Um, sometimes there's a few in here that even give you uh, three or a familiar, things like that. But anytime that you have one uh, that is just giving you plus whatever to a specific stat, you are simply going to increase whatever that number is on your player board without gaining gear upgrades, all right? Because remember, at the beginning of the game, you can only purchase uh, at the very beginning up to six, um, 
first gear upgrades, and that's only to start off your character. You then have to find the first monastery in order to even purchase up to your second one. All right. Um, actually, it's find your first monastery and uh, have unlocked one crypt. Um, apologies for that. But um, power up cards increase this number without adding to your gear upgrades. So you can see here, I got all the way up to 10 with actually only purchasing one gear upgrade in my bestiary mastery. Let's talk about escorts. So escorts are uh, essentially allies that you come across, NPCs that you come across usually as part of a circumstance role. And then they're gonna join you in the party for uh, a various period of time. Most of the time, they're going to give you um, a rune uh, for completing some sort of kind of pick up and deliver goal, usually escorting them somewhere. Um, but there's a few things that are a little confusing about escorts that I'm hoping to, to clear up now. So every escort uh, has a health value. So I'm just going to spread these four out here uh, so you can see them all. Um, so you can see each one of these has a health value. Now these two right here have a defense value. Uh, this guy actually has an attack value and the missionary here has a single navigate stat. Now this is just a selection of escorts um, that you're gonna come across throughout the game. But the biggest thing is uh, that you need to remember is that if you have an escort with you, uh, you are going to have to roll a target die for them during battle. A target die being anytime a, an enemy says they're targeting a single person or just a duo or a triple and there's more than three of you, uh, you're gonna roll a core die for each one of you and the highest uh, number or numbers are the ones who are targeted by that particular affliction by the enemy. So these guys could take damage. Now they can be healed just like any other person using um, uh, an item like a potion or something like that. Uh, and they also will be healed if they like enter a monastery or you camp or you uh, go into a village and you, you pay to stay at the end, stuff like that. Um, but these two guys you can see have kind of a built-in defense. They're not going to do anything else other than defend um, for four if they are attacked. Whereas, uh, what's his name here, Marco here, he will actually attack for three uh, every declaration phase. And then the missionary here, um, he will actually not defend, um, so he's very vulnerable. But what you can do with him is A, you can choose to uh, roll for him during, if you have a navigate roll test, and you see he has a pretty decent navigate skill here, which means he kind of knows his way around. He's been around the block a lot of times. He, your whole thing with the missionary here is trying to get him to all the monasteries to gain the consecration charm. Uh, you don't have to do that, um, but every time you walk into a monastery, you get a green rune, so, but he can help you keep from getting lost. Also, if you are to roll a navigate skill test within a battle, you would also roll for him as well. He can, again, help you overcome that more than half of the group. So if you see a skill test for them or a skill test amount, that means you can actually uh, roll for them anytime you are, you know, it's a benefit to you. Also know that anytime you are escorting someone, you can lose them. Um, anytime you want, they can die and there is no penalty for you. In this instance, if the missionary would die, you're not gonna get the consecration charm. You would stop gaining runes. Uh, these two, you would stop gaining runes. In the case of the zealous bard here, he actually stays with you your entire time until you choose to leave him be wherever it may be out in the wild or, you know, there's no penalty. Um, he gives you some stuff. You can uh, roll any stat test at a rank four. Um, during the skill phase. He gives you a minus one bonus roll um, to those if you've just vanquished because he's kind of like following behind you and singing. Uh, he does negatively affect you during combat, but only in stat tests. Uh, but also if you camp with him um, in a village, he's gonna gain you four gold because he's gonna sing and people are gonna throw him money. So, you know, he's, a, he's an interesting character. Uh, these three guys, you can see, have the interrupt uh, here at the top have the interrupt action, which means as soon as these cards are drawn, these guys, these three guys here, are added to your party. You instantly find them, and then you can actually 
while you're escorting them add clues to them which are going to give you more benefits when you do complete the task whereas the zealous bard here he's an event uh, which means that his card comes out onto the circumstance row this is a day card i believe yes so this will come out on the day road day row and when you roll whatever slot he's in that's when you find the bard so hopefully i uh kind of made sense of everything but just so you are aware um, there's a lot of kind of uh, nuances about escorts uh, and I wanted to make sure I covered all of those the biggest thing being is that they can be targeted in battle you do have to keep track of their health in some shape or form do that on the battle map probably um, and you can roll for their skills or you know attack with whatever their their skill is uh, given at the bottom of the card here so hopefully that helps with escorts a little bit Aegis is uh, something that is new to this volume of Hexplorit, and uh, Aegis uh, is uh, an old term for protection, basically. So these guys are protected in a way that means you have to be powerful enough to even damage, damage them or reduce their energy pool down to zero. You need to exhaust them uh, before you can do damage to them. So what you're looking for with Aegis is, first of all, the gold or orangish uh, uh, level symbol here. So in other ones, it would just be a gray and black one. Like this guy's a level two. These guys are level four and fives, but they also have ages. You also want to look beneath them, and this is telling you how much uh, attack gear upgrades you need to possess in order to even do damage to them. So. What's interesting about this is that you could play through the entire game, and um, you know this is just an example here of my my Shadow Rider near the end of the game. He has 14, uh, and you can see here I actually purposefully purchased several gear upgrades for him so that I was prepared to take on Mirza Noctis. But you could get up to 14 without where's my eraser here without uh, having purchased but maybe one attack upgrade because of power-up cards, all right? Um, remember, we talked about power-up cards already. Power-up cards add to that number without actually giving you gear upgrades. So you have to have, for this greed character here, two attack and gear upgrades to even damage this person. If not, then you have to reduce his energy pool, which is 14, down to zero, then you can attack him. All right, same thing with Shadow Dragon here. It's half of this number rounded up. So in this case, five divided in half is 2.5, rounded up is three. So you would need three attack gear upgrades to even be able to do damage to this individual. Um, this individual actually happens to have bribe. Bribe um, uh, is explained well enough, I think, in the rule book, and it's rare that I'm not gonna cover it in this video. Um, but just so you know, that's how Aegis works. It's a protection uh, that these guys have, and you have to be powerful enough to get through that protection or exhaust them first, then you can hit them. So have no fear if you come across, even say this guy early on, attack his, uh, his energy first, and then you'll be able to attack him. Both these guys are nice because they give you crypt keys. Um, so that is Aegis. Uh, you're looking at your attack gear upgrades and essentially you're just looking at this picture at the bottom. Does this picture uh, look like your attack stat? If it does, then you are set. So there's two sides to the Mirza Noctis board. Uh, there's the undead or uh, ascendant. Um, and then there is the full ascendant side. Both of them have this big cutout. This one's stats, however, are uh, drastically increased. He even has evasion seven, defend five, regen three, a uh, whole lot of bad stuff. So, and he's at 10 Aegis. You would basically need almost all of your attack upgrades. Why would you ever uh, attack him on this side? You say this side is much easier. Well, if you look back at your, where to go? Put it down somewhere your villain track board here. Remember, you are keeping track of your blood pool throughout the game. Whenever your blood pool surpasses 30 here, uh, Mirza Noctis enters ascendant form. So that becomes his form. He's no longer undead. Uh, all he needs to do is get one blood 
to become undead. So if you have him between 1 and 30, you would certainly want to keep him on this side. This side is basically for if you've allowed the blood pool to make it all the way up to 100 and have not reduced it down at all. Why is that? Well, that's because on this side, this is basically Mirza Noctis, and you remember that at the end of the game, for every 10, or before you take him on in the final battle, for every 10 blood he has in the blood pool, you're going to roll a core die, and you're going to augment his stats, which means flip them over to this reddish side. You can see here that this says uh, attack stats, so this would be his uh, hex roll, or number one on a core die. But if you roll this and augment it, you're gonna flip it over, and it's essentially just a nastier attack. All right, so there's uh, six of these things that can be augmented, but then you'll notice all the way down here, seven, eight, nine, and 10, because a core die is a 10-sided die, these are gonna do things um, like upgrade his passive ability. Uh, it's gonna raise his vitals by the amount of blood he's gathered. Get Noctis, gain, if you roll a nine on the core die because of one of your rolls, he's gonna gain evasion seven and defend five. So all this is on this side is simply having taken all of this extra stuff at the bottom and gone ahead and put it up here for you to easier track. So this is the side that you would use if you allowed the blood pool to get all the way up to 100 and uh, did not turn in runes at crypts to be able to reduce the blood pool at the end of the game. So it's really up to you what side you want to use, but you would only ever want to use this side and all of its stats if you happen to have rolled seven, eight, nine, and 10 during the augmentation phase before you fight him. So that's why there's two sides of the board. Next, let's talk about critical wounds. So each character is uh, supposed to get one of these critical wounds trackers. It's you know basically just a, a kind of a punch out that allows you to put these black cubes in here to track your critical wounds. If you ever fill it up, you are dead. Now, there are some instances, for example, these bewitched tools here uh, may say something like single three piercing critical health, or may say just three critical health. Anytime it says critical, you're going to, in that instance, take three damage to your vital, so I'd go from 27 to 24, but you're also going to take a critical wound. Now this is piercing, so it's automatically gonna go through even if I had defense up. Now if I have defense up and I have blocked it all, I'm not gonna take that critical wound, but um, anytime it says critical and you actually take damage from that attack is when you put one of these black markers down and if this whole thing fills up, then you're out. And again, this was three piercing critical health. I took three down off my health, but I only took one cube because it's only one instance of an attack. I would not take three cubes, all right? So anytime it just says critical health, you're only taking one cube, no matter how much damage you're taking for your health. Now let's talk about greater aspects and keepsakes. So greater aspects are different than aspects. Aspects are, um, uh, basically traits that you can gain. You you have the option to start with them at the beginning of the game. They are optional. Uh, they might game, make the game a little easier. Um, or you may come across uh, certain events that give you a certain trait. Greater aspects, however, are almost like uh, ways of, of turning you into the non-living. Um, uh, making you damned or blessed or turning you into a vampire or a zombie or a werewolf or something like that. Um, so a greater aspect is you know, kind of changing you out of human form, but keeping you alive. And then a keepsake uh, is essentially turning you into a kind of a, a spirit, uh, an embodied spirit that allows you to uh, keep up with the group and help them out. But you're, you're no longer, say, the Inquisitor or the Shadow Rider or whatever it may be. Both of these, however, give you the ability to come back from the dead. So the biggest thing is, and it's not super clear, is that between keepsakes and greater aspects, most of the time you are given the choice. If you die, you can either go for a keepsake or you can attempt 
for a greater aspect. In my opinion, I would always go for the greater aspect first, unless you uh, are playing in a large group and you really just kind of want to follow along and be part of the group because keepsakes um, are not going to really do much for you. They're going to change the actions that you can do. They're very supportive. Um, and unless you kind of stick around with the group until that group is able to come across an item that can revive you from the dead, uh, you're, you're pretty much just eventually going to expend all of your spirit power and then you are completely done. You can at that point create a new hero though. Let's just get that clear. But greater aspects and keepsakes, the biggest thing I wanted to cover here is that when you die, you get to choose. Do you go for your keepsake or do you go for your greater aspect? Both of them, you're gonna to have to be doing some dice rolling, so they're not guaranteed, but both of them, if you don't gain one, then you can go for the other. In the rule book here, it states that if, you don't, if you're not offered a, a different type of greater aspect, you can always roll for one of these. So you can have ghost, reanimated, zombie, or five through 10 is nothing. It says here, though, um, if no other effects grants you a greater aspect. So that would be in a situation like this on the collector board. If you die by collector, you can roll the moon die. If you happen to roll the hex, which is, you know, one in 12 chance, you can become reanimated or a zombie or a vampire if you happen to be attacked by the vampire sanguimancer. Um so this would be an instance where a greater aspect is offered to you. Again, you're still having a roll for it, um, but you always get the choice. Do you want to go for the keepsake or do you want to try and take on a greater aspect? Remember, that's kind of changing you out of human form, turning you into a zombie, turning you into a vampire, but you get to keep playing. Um, you probably have some negative attributes that you'll have to deal with, but you can still damage. Um, you can you know, still be damaged, things like that. So. That is greater aspects versus keepsakes. All right, my first tip uh, for everyone sh should be pretty straightforward, but a lot of people I hear talk about how they came across an encounter that was too much for them early on in the game. It wiped out their entire party and they were done. Game over in 30 minutes, no fun at all. What you really need to be doing early on until you have increased your, your vital stats, your attack stats into something that can take on any encounter really um, is move cautiously. That means you follow the roads or you move one or two steps at a time. Um, mainly following rivers and roads. This will allow you to discard a circumstance, including an encounter, um, if you roll it or if you have a circumstance out on the night or day board and it's not a favorable one. If it's an encounter that you realize you is above your head, above your pay grade for the moment, having moved cautiously allows you to, uh, you know, uh, bypass it, to just walk around that encounter and allow yourself to build back up. Now I know that's not as exciting, it's moving pretty slow. So really it's kind of find those roads, and follow those roads. Don't uh, venture off into the wilderness quite yet until you have built your character up a little bit more, but it's gonna keep you alive until you have upgraded your character. And that's the name of this game, really. This game is all about character creation, uh, creating the best character you can in the time allotted before you have to go off and face Mars and Octus. So. It's not about running around and how many uh, map tiles you can flip over in a three hour time period. For my second tip, um, I wanna talk about your kind of food items that you can purchase from villages, uh, especially early on in the game. I see a lot of people buying mysterious meat pies and suspicious stews. Um, now these uh, can all be used, consumed in place of food if you ever fail your survival check. All right, but so can moonshine. Moonshine, you pay two gold, you're gonna get three units of moonshine. And just consuming one of those units replaces eating food during a failed survival check, all right? So for two gold, you basically get three passes on a failed survival check, all right? Mysterious meat pie, you're gonna get two, and suspicious stew, you're only gonna get one. Now, moonshine does not remove a level of starving. That's fine. You can't get drunk and, and feel, expect your belly to feel full. We understand that. But 
each one of these, one, two, three, gives you some sort of negative effect when you consume them. You've failed your survival check. You have to consume something. It's not gonna be normal food. So there's gonna be some sort of damage to you. Mysterious meat pies, you have to suffer two energy damage when consumed. At the beginning of the game, you don't have a lot of energy, all right? Suspicious stew, you become disoriented until the end of the game turn. That, that's no good. Whereas moonshine, all moonshine does is fails your explore skill check and most likely you've already rolled all three dice and you've probably already failed your explore roll remember your explore roll is finding gold so all this means is that you got drunk as you're stumbling along you don't get disoriented so you don't get lost you just if you pass some gold you wouldn't have noticed it but this in my opinion is a great way for getting three for the price of two and only the negative effect is failing your explore skill check is a great way to keep you from getting going into starving mode when you're at the beginning of the game when your survival stat is low so that's my second tip all right my next tip uh is involving activating runes and crypts versus imparting runes in monasteries. Now, monasteries is a great way to uh, reduce the blood pool. If you're um, doing set rewards, you're also gaining graces, um, which can be nice boons that allow you to um, you know, speed up your movement, things like that during the day and night phases. Uh, it's gonna give you a lot of power-up cards if you start doing matching rewards, but, 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 this is my tip here. Um, some of you may have picked up on this already. When you uh, activate runes in a crypt, for every uh, number that you activate, you're still getting a power-up card. You're also gonna start gaining blood magic cards, which are these uh, basically skills that uh, look like this on the backside. And you're gonna be taking critical health to do them. You know, you're gonna be hurting yourself, but they're very powerful. Um, actions that you can take and um, but what this does is as you track which runes you've activated in a crypt at the end of the game for as far to the right as you are for the three different colors you're going to reduce the blood pool for that many so you can see here at the end of the last game I was able to reduce the blood pool by 36 for having uh, activated six green runes 16 so this is in addition to the 36, 16 more for activating four blues and nine more for activating three reds. So the blood pool was allowed. It did get up to 100 in this game, but then I reduced it by this amount before we went through that uh, augmentations phase by... Um, to give Mirza Noctis his powers. So this greatly reduced the blood pool, it greatly reduced the Aegis I had to go up against, it greatly reduced the amount, number of powers that he got to augment. Don't sleep on activating runes in crypts versus monasteries. My next tip uh, involves the power deck, but two specific cards within the power deck, the Blessed and the Damned. Uh, these are both power of cards they're going to give you a boost to some of your stats right off the bat and it's going to tell you um, that if you activate for this one activate a rune in a crypt and this one is uh, impart a rune in a monastery to get blessed whenever you do that that individual character is going to gain a greater aspect all right this is not uh you have died and gained a greater aspect this is throughout your adventures you've gained a greater aspect but these two in particular all right, and remember, these are going to be mixed into this huge deck of power-up cards, but it is not hard to get through this deck if you're playing the game correctly. If you're trying to find runes, and then you're taking them to crypts or monasteries to impart or activate, you're going to go through this deck probably once uh, in a game. All right, and again, hopefully, you've come across these two I mean, obviously, if you go through the entire deck, unless you accidentally left these two cards out, they're going to be in there somewhere. But don't ignore these. Don't sleep on these. Um, at the end of the game, 
if you haven't if you have to travel to a monastery at the last minute or travel to a crypt because these two greater aspects in my opinion were specifically designed to help you have an easier time of defeating Mirza Noctis these two uh, were designed they allow you to kind of increase your gear upgrades for your attack against opponents with Aegis we know that Mirza Noctis is going to have Aegis um, it allows you to gain grant regen to um, your group and allows you to uh, deal additional energy damage on top of your attack damage so these two right here are some of the most important cards uh, in my opinion in the game uh, specifically for taking on Mirza Noctis at the end of the game